So anyways, again, like I said, I'm Jason Vance, um, the Senior Site Reliability Engineering Manager. Uh, my uh, cloud team we have here is actually fairly large. Uh, for uh, the most companies, we have about uh, 35 people on the team doing various roles uh, of what we're doing. But one of the things I'm mainly responsible for uh, my area, I, I manage the site reliability engineering. I also uh, manage our uh, incident process as well. So uh, I, I manage the incident process. One of the things that uh, we're working to excel, one of the things we really have is an actual real defined incident process. Even though we have uh, we have millions and millions of users every day, every month, um, within, the, within our software, we have both a, a citizen-facing site where you can go and do things The software we have. We do the uh, citizen-facing site, and then yesterday, we have the back office site, which the cities used to run. So we've developed software that does things like, anybody ever paid a uh, water bill online or to the city? Have you ever got a permit online to like build something or uh, at events, things like that, pretty sure it's our software. So what we do is we have a software that's basically a, a workflow engine, something like, uh, it could be akin to like Salesforce, Workday, uh, any of those type of softwares. And so we have one of the unique things. We're not a, you know, we're an enterprise company. We have lots of customers. Uh, the best thing about it is there's low churn rate, but the problem is with the, our systems was that we come in and we can have all kinds of uh, noisy neighbors problems because we're a you know, SaaS company. We have multi. We have a in our uh, you know in each of our accounts we have about two hundred uh, different agencies in each of our data centers. We just you know Azure, and so within our software, one of the, the crazy things is you can do reporting in there. You can do uh, you can actually query the database. You can do things like uh, you can actually use uh, JavaScript to do uh, you know do your own custom workflows for the software. So we presented some really, really unique problems that we had to solve in doing and uh, dealing with incidents. And so I came up with this, uh, you know, this process a couple years ago when we came out here, how we handle incidents. And one of the best things: how many people like incidents? I love them, and I'll tell you why. What happens with incidents is that, especially if you have a defined process with that, you actually can learn from it. And then, you know, if you can do that, and that is, you know, we're going to go through kind of the steps of, you know, how we start an incident. Uh, what we do during an incident, how we form, and this is not for everybody. Uh, you know, I've got some feedback. You know, oh, we don't do this. We have a small team. However, you know, you, you can kind of scale it down and, and kind of do that. But we have things like we have. Uh, and these are true stories. I have, uh, you know, one one table in our database that has ninety eight million rows in it. Had some person do a quick query that decided to uh, start, to, you know, start row locking and do a table scan on it. Took our you know huge 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 Oracle database and then we used that as an incident. We went in and we learned, and I was able to create a feedback loop that where we can say things and send it to right back to the you know engineering team to be able to fix those problems. And so what happens when you get the feed full feedback loop? We all know kind of the DevOps lifestyle, right? And you go in, you go, you get a quick feedback loop. You go, you fix it. You go around in a circle. I've got a lot of people who tell me, uh, how many people here have a defined incident process? Can you, can you give an example? What do you mean by feedback? So, you know, the, you know, a true DevOps model, and you know, with ours, we're kind of a hybrid uh, that you would go out and do a deploy, right? And you go out, you do a deploy, and it forks, and you have a you know a problem. So, what does the DevOps people do? They go they'll roll back to like go back to the latest version. They'll go in and study what happens, and then they'll get feedback. They'll go fix it, and then it goes back. They go out and deploy again. But uh, we, we, we use kind of a, you know, we, we have DevOps within our team. For, we, we have that. So we have a, a release uh, management team that goes in and they're building the pipeline, things like that. We have our SRA team, our DBE team. But one of the things that we, we didn't have in common is we'd have these incidents, but we never learned from them, if that makes sense. We never really cataloged them and did this. So, you know, with this process, like, like I say, I'm going to give you the caveat that it doesn't work for everyone. But this is the process we use, we've developed, we've developed between using kind of a hybrid between DevOps and ITIL4 uh, service management in there, and then being able to do that and being able to get that feedback. Does that make sense to everyone? It does. So, so if it might mean that, you know, response from the customer did it work or where, where it was unstable again or something like that, right? Uh, well, the, the, the number one job, and we'll go through there, when you're in an incident, the number one, what's the number one thing you want to do? Restore service. Restore service, thank you. It is get service back to the customers as quick as possible. How many people use, the, how many people have big com complex systems that have many, many different services? 
Uh, we have, I think, close to 25 different services within our distributed systems, and we have uh, 47 different clusters. So we have kind of an massive footprint of, uh, of things. So the, the, the idea is, is get service back and get, get it stable. Does that make sense? So, you know, we talk about incidents, and, uh, you know, one of the things is uh, anybody been in conversation with, uh, you know, people and what they define as an incident or, you know, how they define it? I have a very, very, very simple um, uh, simple definition here. Incident management is a management communication process to control the faults and disruptions for any customer-facing system. Uh, any disruption, any service that affects one single user, that's an incident. Um, and this is anything that interrupts business continuity, right? So for, for us, we most of the our users on our system, they're all con doing, conducting business all day long. I mean, this is in thousands and thousands of cities across the world that uh, they're using our software. And if, if one single customer you know, does something can't work, we, we call it instant. Um, and that you know, has to do with we have you know, very, very good monitoring in place. Um, Jason, I have a question. Sure. And how do you distinguish so, so sometimes you have sure. that gray line. So yeah, we actually do that. We do service management. So an incident is, like I said, anything that's customer facing that interrupts. A service request may be things like, hey, we need a, a you know a database update to our, our tables. We need fee schedule updated. You know things like that. A service request. Uh, the way we do it, we, our service requests are actually all defined. Um, a defined process, right? Right, but sometimes, you know, a customer would log an incident. You would look at it and say, ah, this is not really an incident, it's actually a service request. What do you do then? Um, we have a really defined process for our, our, our support. So we don't get we don't get things like that by the time it gets to, to my team. I mean, we really go, there, we know there's an incident going on, it's affecting, you know, production systems. And so we, we do that. Uh, our service requests, like like you say, we, we have to find service requests, like uh, we you know deploy at a new agency or you know things like that. Those are very defined steps that we do service requests in there. And incident is just any interruption we have. That's that, that's the production system. Does that make sense? So a service request is not really an interruption. It's it's. Well, no, I understand that, but sometimes what happens is let's say you know a user is basically accessing some information and they basically go and say, hey, I don't see that data. You get it, and you're like, well, that's because you need to basically request a refresh of the data. So it's not really an incident, it's basically right. a user issue. So now, so for yeah, us, so we, actually have a, we actually have a data refresh between your agencies, and it's no, a defined exactly. request. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not really an incident because it's a defined yeah. request, it's not yeah, impacting to the customer. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, the other thing with the, the way of crisis management, I don't know if anybody knows, uh, do you know where the, the uh, ITIL uh, crisis management came from? Maybe know the background of it. Uh, the, the steps that ITIL process used in a crisis management actually came from the 1980s. The, the, I can remember this when I was a child. There was a ton of fires in California. And actually, the uh, California Fire Authority came up with a crisis management process. And this is where we kind of take this from. I, I, I really like it. If anybody's seen me talk before, or anybody knows, I'm really, really impressed with you know a couple of things. One was the, the California Fire, you know, crisis management, how they deal with fires, and how they how they, how they do that. And then the second, <clears throat> the second thing that I'm very very fond of is the New York City uh, the fire fire code. And if you've ever read the history behind that, what how many lives were lost 150 years ago compared to today in fires, and, and the, uh, how big the population is, they went in and put all these bumpers and rules into place to, to prevent that. So kind of both of those have like these defined processes and, and how you do it. So when, I'm, when we kind of go through our process here, you know, if you do have something like that, take it back and, you know, you can adjust as, adjust as needed for your, your organization. Hello. Hi. So we're going to do that. So crisis management, uh, we call it running a prod. Um, we just we use that for short because it's too hard to do the production incidents on there. Um, we're, we're aimed at uh, to determine, you know, what we do is with the crisis management, was we take each incident and we go ahead and uh, assign it in a severity matrix. We use just four simple things. We have a sub zero, sub one, sub two, and sub three. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of go through there and we have an appropriate threshold with all those. And when we, if we see something that an incident is happening through our monitoring, whether monitoring, customer reported, we run an incident. 
and we run through the incident management process and it's it's actually quite extensive and we'll, we'll go through this because we go through from the you know, restoring service and then if we're done with the restoring service we're not done with the incident we actually go through there and we provide analysis we go in and you know figure out what's going on we provide documentation feedback and then we get that back to our development team on there or when you, you know my team say we did something on a deployment or something like that so this is, uh, you know, and this is how we define it. So, you know, you were kind of asking how how we define it. Um, we have an S how many people have SLAs that they have to follow? Uh, three nines, five nines, no, almost five nines. Is that right? Five nines as well. Uh, what is that? Like Forty three seconds a year or something like that. You could be down. <laughs> it's something ridiculously small. But that's exactly what it is. Any any failure or service that was designed with an SLA in place, it's a production. If that makes sense. So we, we go in there, first thing we do is once we, we've determined there's a production incident happening, we go in there and we find the severity and we instantiate it and go there. And it's, severity is all about customer impact. That's all it is. It is customer facing, you know, <clears throat> when you're doing a, an incident, anything is customer facing. Uh, we react on it. My team, we jump like firemen, you know, I was teasing, you know, teasing we're like, we're like Marines, we'll just go barge in and get, you know, get it done. We're like firemen, we'll just jump to the fire, figure it out, and then, you know, things after that. But it's always how it impacts the customer. And again, like I said, we know <clears throat> that we, one of our services impacting one customer, we run an instant, and we have millions of customers. And we do that so that, uh, you know, we try to improve, like, keep our uh, customer service happy, and they see that. So this is the uh, Excel uh, severity matrix. It's pretty. It's uh, it's pretty simple. So we have sub zeros. Uh, anybody ever had a uh, cloud outage? Just had one uh, a little while ago. We were actually uh, one of our upstream service providers. We had to run a sub zero at three o'clock in the morning, rally the troops, got everybody in, and we knew what the problem was. But we still brought the whole incident response team in to come in and then take care of it. So sub zero is anything that's uh, you know uh, that uh, anything is hard down. That's down with our service. And like I said, we have you know a bunch of services that's uh, within our uh, application clusters, and any if all of them are down. We call a sub zero. Uh, since I've been here, we've had like maybe three or four sub zeros. All of them been out of my control. Wouldn't be able to, to deal with it, but uh, we do that. Sub one. That's pretty much where we do most of our uh, work. It revolves around somebody's not being able to do business with our software. And so we, we run a sub one, we go in there, and you can also see that we have a couple things. Uh, on sub zero, we have uh, like a security breach that, that would run as a sub zero. We've had like one or two of those since I've been there. Sub one is, we think there could be a security problem, but we're running, we're running, we run as a sub one. What it does is you can see our response times here. So we run a prod, we run a prod. So we have time to respond. Uh, everybody familiar with the, the mean time to respond metric? How many people measure their team on that? So not a lot, a few of you. Uh, we require our incident management team, which is, we'll kind of go through here and how we define it. We require them to respond within five minutes of being paged. So when you're on uh, when you're on call, and the, our, our teams are generally uh, only on call once every five weeks on the team, uh, but we still, like, you have to respond within five minutes, and we actually use that metric to, to uh, work with them on that. Uh, the meantime, to resolution, 15 minutes is our goal. So that we're not down more than 15 minutes on a uh, sub zero. I'm going to tell you my experience every sub zero. <laughs> We've been hours and hours because it's been either uh, upstream ISP, you know, century link, that, you know, goes down, <laughs> does a router failure, and you know, things like that. But uh, our goal is on a sub zero is 15 minutes. So for a sub one, we require the team to respond within 15 minutes. Uh, a lot of that, and the, the reason we we have a little bit more relax on the sub one is a lot of my team during the daytime we're building stuff. Uh, you know, we're going in and we're writing, you know, pipelines or we're doing, you know, uh, infrastructure or we're doing something like that. So we came about 15 minutes. Generally, my uh, mean time to respond to my team is about three minutes from when incident's called is on average just do that. Our mean time to resolution, everybody familiar with that? That is uh, from the, when the incident calls to when we can say it's closed is the, the, and we average that within the team. We want to be under 30 minutes. And we actually, uh, one of the things I do with my team is every quarter we revisit these and we adjust it as necessary on there to do that. But sub two is like a critical impact, uh, like a, a sub one would have worked around. How many people go, you know, you're kind of alluding to like a customer, his data's not working. We can go, well, here's a workaround to do it. And they go back and they, they get a, we still call it production incident. 
as long as, uh, like I said too, as long as we can give some sort of workaround for the customer, it's still a production incident. It's still, a, it, it, we still have a full team that comes in and responds, but we can actually go, okay, okay, we found a workaround for you, this, or, or do the, with our software, like I said, they do a lot of reporting, things like that. You go, okay, well, you know, it's not working for you, so let's help you, you know, craft a query, we can work around, you know, some of your pops. And then step three, we have a lot of those. So, uh, anybody have, uh, every, who practices uh, um, DevOps here? Okay, how many people have a uh, operations? So, most of our operations team, they deal with the sub zeros. I actually have an operations team, I've had a few people argue with me before, uh, you know, uh, DevOps is the operations team, and I, you know, call them BS on that one. And so, uh, you know, if you have any sort of large scale enterprise application, you need eyes on 24 seven on that application to, to be able to do that. So when they see like events or things like that, say like a service or a, like a single node goes out, uh, with our application, because of all the complexities inside of it and stuff, it, sometimes it'll go out and it'll just totally like take down a server or our service. So if they see like a single server or you know a couple servers are not working, we call self three. These are uh, not like the, the the rest of these. We'll handle those things. We'll do things like service restarts. So we'll go in there, we'll, uh, but we still do the analysis on that stuff. Even if we do like a single node or you know a couple nodes on you know a cluster for a service. We still call it step three. We go in and do it, and you know we, we get it back. And again, the first thing we do is restore service back to the customer because we know with ours, uh, you know, with our our clusters they're low balanced, but uh, we have an enterprise application that's not modernized. So uh, we actually have sticky sessions on there. So we'll have a few customers affected, but that's why we still run incidents. Uh, Jason, do you folks manage your own data centers, or do you use one of the public cloud? Yes, and yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Azure, uh, AWS, and we actually manage our own data centers. You know, if anybody wants to hear my opinion on data centers, I'll go off on them. But uh, our own data centers are far cheaper and far more efficient. And I can tell you this, I have a better uptime in my data centers than Azure does. <laughs> so we do both. We do kind of a hybrid model. Um, we have like some services, so for instance, we use Elasticsearch service and AWS because I don't have time to manage, you know, uh, it's like 100 nodes, last search cluster in there. And so we just use those as service. We're, we're actually moving towards Azure right now. So we're, we're looking to take out everything out of our data centers and move it into Azure. So it's, it should be an interesting journey. So can I host my servers in your data center since it's better than Azure? What? Can I host my servers in your Yeah, data yeah you can get my team to do it. My, uh, my team to do it. They're, they're actually really good. I mean, we've, I can tell you this in our data centers, I've only had one outage in three years. On there, and that was uh, yeah, again. It was an upstream provider was doing a uh, router maintenance, and they had firmware that uh, went bad, and they didn't know how to fail over to the other one. So we keep pretty good. So, so you know, we're talking about roles, and so again, this doesn't really work for everybody, but uh, this comes from the you know, California Fire Authority and how roles are in crisis management situation. And so we, we we've taken ours and we. Put it into a couple different roles. So these are actually all on rotations. They're all you know all you know, callable through page. So we have so the first one, the first and primary is the technical duty officer, right? That is uh, usually me or uh, another senior member on my team. What we do, uh, we're command and control. We handle the incidents. I do not actually go and make the remediations. I do not go and, and go into and look at logs. I don't go look at you know our APM. We use App Dynamics. I go in there and I go, okay, I need you. I need you, you to come in and get into this incident. And I have to, you know, within our company, I can pull anybody into an incident into the call. Um, we have a admin on duty. And we actually have multiples on there. We have a database engineers. They're on call. Um, we have our network operations center. Who's on call? They they're actually on the you know the eyes on you know the monitoring systems and they'll, they'll watch trend even before we alert on things. And then we have site reliability engineering that comes on there. And typically we have a senior member of the team that's on call on the rotation to be able to jump in. The reason we do we have all three of those is we all have you know, specific knowledge operations team. They have the site reliability engineering team. We we know how to go. Oh, did, where did it break in the pipeline? Where did it break when we're doing deployment? Did it break when we did you know this? Did we do an update? And we also have the DBEs. So that team, what they do, their whole focus is restore service as quick as possible, right? So I'm typically going in and going, hey, I need the, you know, 
you should probably be working there and go in and go and look at it, see our, our log entries thing. And then, you know, and I sort of dive in and look at the logs or the doc look and go, oh, we see where that error started to happen. And be able to do that and then be able to relay it back. The next thing we have is we have an executive on duty. Um, not all companies have this, but it's one of the things I think is a little more unique. Uh, the reason we have that is so that we can uh, execute on duty. Um, they generally don't get in the incident calls unless I pull them in. Um, and the reason being, uh, you know, they're not needed in the incidents, but what happens is, is if there's something that I think is going to have a business risk, I'm going to go uh, uh, talk to the ex uh, executive on duty. I'm going to make them go ahead and make the hard business call on there. Because uh, my job is not to make the business call. My job is to restore service and you know, make sure that our, uh, our incident management is working. So they'll go in there and they'll say, hey, we're going to do this, or we have to do this. So that is what I was talking about. So one of our days says was down. We actually, he was the one that made the choice to, we had at the time, we didn't know it, but we had a 100, 100 meg line back up for our uh, three gigabit uh, pipe in the front. So we had to move air, all of our traffic over there and watch it saturate. But he made that call as a business decision. Um, we also, we bring support on duty. How many people bring support, uh, you know, people in support into their incidents? Good. Because I think that's uh, you know that's really important. Our customer support, they are the voice of the customer. They usually interface it, and we usually actually have more than one customer support team. We usually have a customer support manager who will jump between, uh, you know, if there's anything with the... Oh, sorry, I just see somebody said the door. Um, our, our, our customer support, we usually have two people that come in and get on to an incident. They jump on there. One of them usually will interface with the customers and say, hey, we're working on it, we'll do this, and they're relaying updates to them. So that it's it's good. We have the other customer support. What may be on there? They're looking at. We we use Salesforce for our customer support interface. So they're going in and looking at any new cases, anything related to the incident, so they can group those all together and do that. So they they do that. Customer support also is my partner when we're running as a technical duty officer. When I'm making updates and we'll kind of go through the, you know how we communicate to customers, I usually will go and say you know make an update and I'll hand it to customer support and I go is this okay to say? Do you think this is you know good? Is this Sure, it's enough information, but not, you know, Joe Blow was going and, you know, restarting the service or restore service because it the, they failed to start. You know, we don't provide that, but we'll provide some sort of <clears throat> information to the customer and they'll, they'll go back there. Then, the other thing that's really important in this management process, and I know a lot of people hate this, but we bring in dev QA into, into our incidents architecture. Anybody that I feel like I need it, typically we usually bring senior developer in software developer because they can help with some things that uh, my team doesn't have the knowledge of. But you know, my team is usually you know, is engineering, you know, it's, it's reliability engineering, so we're out building, you know, building things, but the development team, bringing them in, they can go in and do things like if we do a memory dump or something like that, go do the analysis and say, hey, what, what's going on? Because they know the application very well. Um, kind of give you the, my, my thoughts on that is they, my team has kind of a T-shaped knowledge, we're kind of broad and everything, and then we're very good in operations and automation. Uh, development, they have a very, just I, they're very, very deep into the software application. So we bring them in, and depending on the service as well. Does that make sense to everybody? Jason, what about when, when you say you bring in your dev QA people, how do you manage things like access and security? So we don't we don't actually we don't give them access to the system. So we our our particular software actually has the back end and the front end. So say for like uh, QA, say if we had a failed deployment or something like that, we actually bring in and say you know help have them help us pinpoint because we're using their tools when we do deployments to, to pinpoint where that is. And then once we restore service, we use QA as a way to validate before we go to the customer because I I don't like going to the customer going service restored and then no it's not. If that makes sense. So we bring them in to, to kind of, uh, to, we, we get that feedback with the code. Okay, QA says it's good. So, you know, service are stored. We can go talk to the customer. We don't close an incident until we get customer confirmation. So they're part of the, the way to validate that architecture. Um, you know, we bring them in just because if they, we have a, a small architecture team, if there's some issues, you know, anything like that, they know that so we have some stuff in like Azure. They helped us architect a, a new cluster definition that we, we spun up there. We had some few issues, so we made them dig and figure out that uh, instead of using load balancer, we had to use application gateways. So we had to make some changes in code and things like that. So that we bring them in when we sometimes we're going, we're not sure what's going on. Does that make sense? Any other questions? What one in time do you bring in that your dev and architecture, you know, is, is dev, it every is it depends or uh, dev, <coughs> they're on call for sub zero, sub two. Yeah. Architecture, you bring in as needed. 
uh, QA, I usually bring them in towards the end of the incident, they're on call, and I'll, I'll bring them in and just like, okay, hey, we did that validation from you. And that thumbs up that I can go back and say service restored. So, got an incident, what do you do? <laughs> Quit your job or leave. <laughs> this is my favorite thing. Step one, identify the problem. Step two, fix it. Yeah. <laughs> so we, that's our kind of joke with Excel. It was like, this is actually our incident management process. <laughs> so what we do is we do a thing called what we call raising, uh, raising a prod. Um, how many people use chat ops? Use it very extensively. Um, been using it for years. So what we do is, uh, you know, step one, identify the problem. We go in and we triage and classify what sort of problem that is. And that may be either one, our monitoring systems. We'll go in and immediately do those. Two, sometimes we get customer escalations. I hate that really bad, but sometimes they're just like, like you kind of mentioned, it's not working for them and it may be a single customer. So we go in and we do triage with that. And we may do that with a knock and we may bring an SRE, you know, at or before an incident. Um, those example, translate pages of Chrome extensions. So we, we couldn't figure out why we were translating correctly for different languages. So then as soon as we go, okay, there's an incident, we buy that severity matrix, we instantiate a prompt. And so what happens on that is we escalate immediately the knock, we bring everybody in, they all get paged, and they come in, they have that time to do that. Um, once we do that, we create a prod channel, and actually all of this, this whole incident process here, you know, I've broken it down, but it's all, I mean, we, we just have a, a Slack bot then we go in there, and so we create a prod channel, we create a bridge automatically, we start that prod bridge, and page the response team, and that all happens within a second, if that makes sense. So we just, uh, for us, we use a, we have a thing called Excelabot, and we just go Excelabot prod step one, give it a name, and all of that stuff happens all at once, and it goes and pages out, does everything it needs to do, sets up the incident so that all you have to do is click, you jump into the Zoom room, and you're there, and ready to go. So. Uh, but this is kind of more broken down how we, you know, how we instantiate that. Any questions? So these teams are working on that. They, the, my teams are, yeah, the, all the teams are we're distributed company. So uh, we have, I have, you know, people in like Oregon, people working from home. I have people in our San Ramon office that people here, people here working from home. Whatever it is, if you're on call, you know it. And so you, you uh, with our teams, we're required to have a, a Jetpack, uh, you know, Wi-Fi spot, and they have to take their laptop everywhere they go. And uh, if they, you know, and we know this is like life gets in the way. We always call it guns for whiskey. You talk to somebody on your team, trade whatever it is. Whatever this hour, you know, ten hours, days, and we just make sure we're always covered for production incidents. So it doesn't matter where it is. It's just immediately boom, you're on, you're in, and we provide our team the tools to be able to do that. So there's no excuse going. Ah, I went to the movies like right now. That's uh, just part of, our, our, part of our culture that we develop. So, you know, the production incidents, you know, the, the, the most important thing is, you know, the year that incident started, what do you do? So, my biggest job is, and I'll, I'll tell you this, is communicating, uh, you know, communicating with the customer because, you know, at the end of the day, the way, you know, I always explain to new employees who come out to my team, at the end of the day, it's all, your job is all about the customer. It's like, it's, you may be doing something, but at the end of the day, the customers want to pay your bill, so you're the one to be able to respond to them. So one of my biggest things is, is communicate, communicate, communicate with the customer, right? So uh, we have, anybody know what a trust page is? So we have what's called a trust page for our customers. That is, and you, I'm sure you guys actually know what it is. Maybe you went and see AWS status page. Yeah. Trust page. Uh, yeah, Azure's trust page, you know, any of the services I use, I have all of those. We actually have them RSS into our, uh, uh, into our uh, Slack so that we can actually see what's going on. There's any incident, anything like that. But that's super important. It, and, you know, every factor because they can see the this. So if you've got some IT manager and he gets a call is going, What's going on? You can immediately go to my trust page and look and say, "There's an incident. This is when it started. This is what we're doing and, and doing." So communication is so key in an incident. Communicate to the customers what's going on because for us, since we're an enterprise, you know, enterprise software company, we've got millions. Of, you know, we've got hundreds of well, probably like fifty thousand people on the back end doing stuff every day in the United States, with like one of our data centers. We've got millions of people who are in the front end who are doing it for the bidding or fishing licenses or stuff like that. And so we communicate to them. This is what's going on because they go, I don't know. You know and isn't that, you know, when you're a user of software and it's not working, you don't know why. Most frustrating. So communication, 
The second thing that I do on the team and like uh, for the TDF, and this is what we do, is we do an internal email to the executives. So anybody that's at the director level position or higher gets an email about every 15 to 30 minutes during an incident because they, have, they are business stakeholders of this and they need to know what's going on. So we communicate that with them as well. Uh, my number one job is customer communication. And then the second one is internal communication so that they know what it is. So account executives, they're on that, they're on that email list and they get it. They will see and we'll go through how we like do our email communication internal, but they get to see this is what's going on, this is account. So they can go, hey, I'm gonna call you up, man. We're really sorry, we're having a production event. You know, this is some, we had a, you know, a problem a couple of weeks ago in the state of California. It was great for the AE. He got on there and he just got on the phone and called him and made like, oh, we didn't even know there's a problem. We got that feedback. <laughs> which actually made us look very proactive for doing that. And then also with that list is executive communication. Uh, we get out and we can communicate business risks, things like that. And we have the executive on duty who is empowered to make business call that we need to on there. So we do this three, you know, these two are combined, but the, make sure that, that it goes out there. And then we do the customer communication as well, if that makes sense. Questions? So I'm going to give you kind of some examples of our trust page, and I'm going to give you some examples of you know, how we do this. This is actually, I'm going to tell you the, the funniest story. Um, what is it? Uh, Statuspage.io. Eight years ago, I said it was the stupidest idea in the world. Then they got acquired by Lassie. And now we use it religiously, which is funny. <laughs> I, was, I remember I was at AWS at the re -event. I thought that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And now we use, like, every day we're, we're using it. So. Typically what we do in an incident, say like one of our services is our ad hoc service, it's like a reporting service. You can see that, uh, you know, we had to, like an incident on there and you can see that uh, some customers may experience an intermittent instance with ad hoc reporting services in the West Coast production data center for currently investigating will update 30 minutes. So, uh, anybody know why I said I'm going to update in 30 minutes? When we're communicating with customers, we want to clearly communicate impacts, how they're being affected, the scope of impact, which was our ad hoc reporting services, line of sight, what we're going to be doing, how we're going to be fixing it, and when we're going to update it again. That gives customers, and this, this comes from, uh, you know, uh, can't remember what the, the psychology behind it, but if you, you give that to customers, they're, they're going to go, oh, okay, somebody's addressing this issue. They don't get so angry, they don't get mad, you know, and people are going, okay, you know, I have an outage, everybody has an outage. So we make sure that uh, we communicate that. Um, Second thing that we do in communications, right, that we do this, we go and we investigate our, our processes, investigate it, identify the problem, um, and we communicate that we're monitoring because how many people have like restored services and then 10 minutes later you have a thundering herd problem? Yeah, I have a bunch of everybody going back in and the service goes right, right back down and you're going, okay. So we, we, we have a process of monitoring for at least 60 minutes where we have eyes on watching that particular service. If there's a problem, watch the logs, make sure everything's good. So we do that and then we resolve the incident finally for the customer and they understand and they get that communication on that. Um, then one of the things that we try to do, which is uh, very difficult because uh, we have such a big complex and so many you know, data centers, is we try to provide a detailed postmortem. Um, and actually one of those things is like a, a postmortem when you're providing that for people, that actually goes, oh, these people actually went in, we've investigated and now we, we, we know what the problem is. An example of my postmortem here is what we do is I give a miniaturized. This is not uh, we we provide the detailed postmortem. This is not like my internal postmortem. This is a customer facing postmortem. So we do a reduced incident timeline. You can see here. Um, we you put in what our restoration plan is that we did in there. Whether it was this so fixed current persistence profile, we had to, one of our load balancers was uh, the reporting service that uh, was not set correctly. And so we, we set the persistence profile up there and then we press pull on it with our networking team to go in and go, hey, you know, we did that. So we, we let the customer know we're working to fix, you know, we're, we're working to fix it. I also give an impact summary on how there, so it says here like between, you know, 110 and 133, you know, Pacific time, and yeah, a number of customers were having sporadic issues with the East Coast Coast customers attempting to run ad hoc reports in our production clusters. Um, we, the, our software, we actually have to develop a cluster for customers where they can go do things and things like that. But we, we give that summary of impact so they understand that. Then we come in and we give uh, you know a, a root cause. I'm not going to give the detailed root cause where I, even, I know what it is. We got to give it a customer facing one. We also give some mitigations how we uh, how we how we fix the problem. And also, with the customers are going, oh, okay, we, we see that. And our, our
our the people who consume this are usually you know CTOs, CIOs, IT directors, things like that. Um, and then we also provide corrective actions. I don't provide the full list like when we do the, our, our our own internal post form, but we provide corrective actions. And you see here, we actually let them know what we're doing here. So we say Excel engineers have corrected incorrect configurations, and then we've completed that. Excel engineers completed a full audit. We completed that. Accelerators have recommended changes from the audits uh, in progress. And so the, that's the customer now, oh, you're doing that. So when they go back to this trust page and we keep this updated, like when we finish this, we'll update it. They go, oh, okay, they fixed that. That problem may not happen again. Does that make sense for everyone? So does that, do you basically use a template? I do. As a, for every incident? I do. So we have, we have a full, and then you know, we get through here, I can show you. We have a full postmortem template, and then we have a customer facing, you know, we call it root cause analysis for them as well. I just don't have super to see what uh, there's. <laughs> so, Jason, who on your team does this? Are these, are these done by the SRE? So, so sometimes, <laughs> uh, a lot of times, it's by the TDO. And sometimes by you know SRE, so if it's like a, a loss of an incident, they'll go through and do the incident analysis. Uh, we'll get to where I'll show you like how we do like get through that as well. Any other questions? Do you do a review? Uh, Is it a review before the before you put this post mortem up to make sure that you're not giving out too much detail? Yes, we actually we actually in the inside the incident channel, I will bring all the stakeholders in and we we'll review it. They will approve it and then we'll post it. Right. Okay. And very much about you know validation and feedback from you know stakeholders on there because it's not just you know my job to respond to it, but they also have to deal with customer like that. So we're talking about internal communication. This is uh, you know same same process. Investigate, identify, and monitor a result. We do the same thing. This is a template. I don't know if you can see this, but we do uh, email subjects and we have this templated out. So we. Right, the severity of the incident, the environment, the data center, customer impacts, who it is, like if it's a specific agency or if it's all customers, and then we put a short description in the email subject. In their body, we do, you know, this is funny, we do, you know, this email's for internal use only, we have to do that because we get some, you know, A's of when we first started that would actually send out the customers and like, no, don't do that. We actually put the incident time when it's first detected. Um, our definition of first detected is not when the monitoring went off or the incident began. It is when it's when it actually happened. We could try to research back and say, "Hey, this happened." Uh, this. And then when the incident began, so that's why there's differentiation between those. There may be you know, we we find out like through customer support that it's three or four customers. You know, cases that kind of trickled in and did that. So the event may have begun at seven thirty in the morning, but we didn't start the incident until ten because we didn't we didn't understand or know the impact on that. So then, uh, one of the things, and everybody gets so tired of me, is I, every incident I would go, summary, impact, scope, uh, and how it's detected. I make you know, the start of every incident, we do that. So we make sure we have that in there. That's important. Um, do you know why? How many people like customers, uh, you know, that will tell you about a, a problem? Just, I hate it. It's embarrassing for my team. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to know how it's detected, who did it, what did it? Because for my team, I use that as internal. It's like, okay, how do we how do we get an instrument for that to, to make sure that doesn't happen, or how can we react quicker? Or where, where are we at? Uh, scope is really you know how big it is, who it is. We we want to know which one of our customers is impacted. And again, like I said, we have a you know multi tenant SaaS environment. Not all customers may be hit by the thing, but I want to know that impact of the, you know the uh, uh, the scope of who it is and what it is, so that we we can actually get the AEs to go out and reach out to them. Or we also have customer success engineers, you know, things like that. They'll go out and reach out to them, and do that. But then they use that that scope. And then what, what I put in there, so you know, we always put an update when we send the email out. I say, hey, this is what we're doing, and they put it into dumb down to the, you know, speak so that the people who are consuming this, you know, don't they don't need to see the big details. And then what I do when I send these things, our current restoration activities, I will go ahead and add, you know, this is what we're doing, we're doing at this time, and we'll, we'll put a list of what we're trying to do. There's been times, you know, when we have things like, oh, we restarted the service, didn't see this, we went there, you know, as it came back, and then we have to go and reinvest it. So we, we make sure they know that. We always put an instant restoration plan on what we're doing now. Anybody understand why that's important? You mean putting in a restoration plan? Yeah, do you, you need to know your restoration plan. How you, you know, your life is, how are you going to re think you're going to restore services? How many people have, uh, you know, went down and had red herrings on it? You know, uh, it's a problem. 
many, many times I've had that happen. But we have to go, oh, we're, we're now looking at this, and then I'll you know, let them know in this communication. It wasn't that. that was, uh, but now we're looking at this to get the service back up and going. And then the other important thing is, is that, again, communication is when is the next update? And we're religious about this uh, when we're doing this. Um, at my team, we have three choices. We have uh, 15 minutes, we have 30 minutes, and an hour. We have to let everybody know that. And so we, uh, with each of these, we will tell them we're investigating, and then we'll send in the same email and just reply back and add more information and identify, monitor, and resolve so that, it's custom, so that stakeholders, they're saying this is started and an instance is done. We can say the bike's wrong in the sand. Any questions? You get an automated alert, or as the TDO, you, you keep track of the, uh, and it, like a, uh, uh, an alert from Slack or something that says, hey, you're at your 30 minutes. Uh, 10 minute roll. No, I'm kind of a nag, so it's just yeah. with my team. I'll help I you out there. I lost track of time sometimes in the middle of a. I mean, it's a good thing, but it's, it's, it's generally, a, and, a, and if I'm not a nag, my boss is a super nag on things. So, <laughs> I mean, we pay attention, I pay attention to every. I'm actually one of these people, and this is, I guess, a club for punishment, but like on my phone, I have every instance for the entire system, the entire world comes on my phone, and I react, you know, 24 7 to it. So I'm just like, uh, you know, even if I'm not the TDO uh, at the time, I'm just like, we're doing it. We're, we're pretty strict about it. I mean, we're not super strict, but it was like, I'll be like, hey, Travis, you haven't given an update in 30 minutes. You said you'd do update in 15 minutes. So he'll go and get, a, kind of get back into that thing. Okay. Ballpark, how many incidents a week or month do you think you average? Uh, we average about 18 incidents a, uh, a week. Uh, within that 18 incidents, um, we have four, five, sub ones, and twos. The rest are all step three. So those are where we have to like say a service or a problem with that's on there. And we do track that very detailed. We'll kind of go into that. So the other thing that we do is like really, really make it a point to communicate with the executives, right? Because generally every, you know, anybody that's director, VP level or higher within the company, C-suite, they're responsible for a bottom line. They're responsible for a, you know, a PE. &E. And so we need to communicate that to them because that can affect you know, what they're doing. So I, I make sure that we communicate with the executives and say, hey, this is how this is a possible you know, problem. You know, so they can do things. One instance was we were in renegotiation with a very large customer. And so he was actually on site with the customer getting these email updates. And they were actually impressed. They were able to go, hey, you know, you're having a problem right now. We're taking care of it. And actually helped the negotiation to give it communication. And you got a raise. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things during the uh, uh, production is that we have, uh, you know, a restoration communication. We have responsibilities into what the communication is. So I'm, I'm really big about communication and the, talking to people and, and making sure they know what's going on. So you can see here as a TDO, I am, you know, command and control. You know, generally me and, you know, we have one other person that takes that. I run the bridge. Here's the thing. Anybody ever had somebody that jumps on a bridge that has no relevance, but so it's talking all the time. I have, you know, I do. I tell them, you know, shut up, let the team talk. If they keep going, I just keep them off the bridge. They'll let back off. And I've done that for a few people that, to, that do that. Um, so I go there. I also, because I've got 25 years of, you know, uh, operational experience, you know, about 20 years of web app development experience in there. I also go, yeah, you probably want to go look under here and do this. I also know our software very, very well. So I, we, we make sure that the TDO, I make sure that you are doing the right troubleshooting. You know, if anybody ever got, you know, like I said, it's red hairs, you get some people galvanic off somewhere, you go, no, 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 no. You got to go back over here, go do that research. So a lot of the job of the TDO is to do that. Um, and also, all of the job, you know, my responsibility again is I bring in any resource. I had called the CTO at 3 o'clock in the morning to make sure that he would bring in two of his best engineers and do, uh, get a problem. I don't have any problem with that at all. And I'll nag him until I get to, you know, get to get the resources that I need. Uh, so, and my job is, like it says, a TDO, I author all the communications, I author all the executive and internal communications. I make sure that customers are updated with that, and uh, that's always was like I said, the support <laughs> approval. We just make sure that so we're going to communicate that. I'm not going to communicate, you know, when we say like with support so approval. I'm not going to communicate things like you know, some dumbass actually took out service because he did terraform destroy and he had to restore the service. You know, that true story. But uh, you're not going to communicate that. <laughs> <laughs> So the restoration team, their responsibilities, they're, you know, I like this, their responsibility is to troubleshoot, investigate things, 
propose it, their, their job is to go, hey, I think we could do this, we'll, we'll restore this service and, and doing that. And so like, again, like with us, we're a big, huge distributed application with many, many services. And so we may have a single service that's not working or has a problem, but they're to they're the propose remediation activities and say, hey, we're gonna go do this in the service or we're gonna look here, that, that's part of their team. And then, like I said, fix it, get it done and, and, and do it. They do not do any communication except in Slack and in LeBridge. That's that's where you do them. And then one of the things that like I, I don't think I put in here. I'm a really, really super big fan of very verbose communication and chat offs. Anybody got any idea why? So you have a detailed record of what went on. Because when you have an incident, when it's fresh in your minds, right? I don't always have time to go down and do a RCA or a postmortem on those. But at least if it's verbose and the very verbose of like any command they run, any single thing like that, we actually have like our we have a couple uh, applications that you know we, we built ourselves in PowerShell. It goes in there and it actually posts to this instant Slack channel what's going on, what command we're at, what service we do that. We do that so that we have a detailed record of what's going on and you understand why we're done. You want to get a little farther in here, why that detailed record is necessary. So they don't they they just have verbose and I always tell them they go dash v, 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 v. Yeah, coming from the Linux background of, uh, yeah, be very, 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 very verbose and then they'll get in and, and then do that. So we make sure they're very verbose of what they're doing. They're talking. One of the things I hate, anybody ever been an incident when you just hear silence? Not on my team. I, we were just like going, you know, 50 miles an hour going, okay, we got to get this out. We got to do this. We got to do this. this, this, this. Yeah, if it's silence, it's not good because you're not communicating at all. And so you're not communicating because we have a distributed team. We need to know, you know, the left hand stand to the right hand. So everybody's very verbose speaking as well as when they're doing restoration activities. And then support on duty. One of the things we use support for, and you were kind of asking, why do we bring them in? We also have them to do repro you know, re steps for us that help us get that from the customer. Uh, they support everybody in there. They support, uh, you know, the TDOs, the ADOs. Their also responsibility is close the loop of the customer. If a customer is, a, you know, a customer is having an issue, they do that. Once in a while, I'll let them run the control bridge. Say if we had, you know, have something, they'll, they'll run it, but typically it's always the TDO. And again, they are, like I said, they're the voice of the customer. They're the customer facing issues. So we make sure that they're in, in every instance. And then the executive on duty, they're not always involved. Like I said, the, I'll bring them in when needed. Um, when I, I make a call, if there's like a business decision to be made, um, we'll bring them in, we'll go, you know, deal with them. They consume all of the, but they consume all the communication, so they know what's going on. Like we had a sub one incident yesterday, and my manager, the, the VP of Cloud Ops, he was in a meeting with the board. It was nice that you could actually say, "Hey, we actually have an incident going on right now, and doing this." He's able to communicate that uh, as well. And, and uh, if there's any iffy, sketchy things that I, I feel like that uh, you know, need to be approved, I, I it's for our trust patients, our customers. And those could be, uh, and what I mean by that is, sometimes you don't want to tell a customer everything, what's going on, and this could be like revenue impacting or things like that. So we'll actually go, I'll go, hey, this is okay, and then they can make the business case on that. So I'm, again, over communicating as much as possible. So some of the things I just kind of put in here, and this is what we, you know, every time a new person on my team comes in, we have kind of some troubleshooting best practices. So one of the things we do, and again, for the communication, anytime we do deployments, anything like that, we have chat channels, you know, uh, we have Slack channels that are created with the deployment, we're doing things, we're monitoring. We also have a deployment calendar that we have on there that has specific jury tasks, like say, and we, we, like we do demos, we also have to schedule uh, deployments because our, our stuff is, uh, again, it's not a stateless application. So first thing I do when you're troubleshooting, we try to figure out what changed in the application. Is there anything that changed that did with some data change? Was there, you know, application change? Was code deployed? Was a configuration change? I usually have, you know, we have a lot of information. We have a kind of a dashboard form so we can see that very quickly. Um, everybody heard the term correlation is not causation. You know, you can see, oh, this event happened, but it may not have caused this. And so we make sure that we put that in, uh, um, and everybody's head that correlation is not causation. And then the other thing that I beat into their heads is it's not the customer's fault. It is our fault because we allow either we didn't put the bumpers in place, we didn't have the right tools in there, but it is always, is never like the customer's fault. Um, I loathe red headings uh, when we're going there because that can actually be revenue impacting and uh, things like that. So, you know, somebody might go down and go there. So we, we try to have very solid troubleshooting techniques. Um, we try to have with every piece of uh, production, like production alerts, there's a run book associated with that. And the reason being is I don't want you going down and, you know, and looking for a red herring. 
at all on there. Um, the other thing is, is like we, we always do this, and how many people have had like you know some customers are reporting this, and it's, it seems like that, but you go to it, it's working fine. So another person goes fine, and another person goes doesn't do that. You know that always is a sign of inconsistent state of your load balancers. Uh, you know whether it's a, you know an Amazon or a, 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 you know, AWS or Azure. You know something you may have like a problem with like a single node or something like that. We always put that in as we're seeing inconsistent behavior. Always look at the load balancer. You know, we have the load balancer for that service. We do that. Um, we always make sure we support theories of data. That make sure they go. Hey, can you prove that? So I'll give you a, a for instance. We have. Uh, yesterday with our production incident that we had, it was actually with our Elasticsearch cluster, and so one of the engineers, and he goes, well, I think we need to increase disk space, and I'm looking at it in CloudWatch, but it's 70%, come on. And he's like, no, no, we need to, I'm like, okay, you need to provide the data, why we need to do that? Couldn't do it, so we're not, you know, we're, we're not increasing the disk space. So making sure that anything you do, you can, you have data to support it, that's, you know, very much in a production incident, go, I can see here, here it is, we make sure, and again, when I say very, very, very verbose, in our Slack channel, we make sure that the data is there. We do two things. Uh, how many people use an APM? So we use like App Dynamics. So right now it's ours. So eventually, probably Elastic Stack. But the APM we use right now, we do screenshots and I make them direct links to the incident to add that timeline. You know why it's important? Post mortem time. Go back and go right back to that. You can see what happened in there when you're looking at that. Same thing with our logs. I like give, give me a snippet of logs, but also give me the link to that so I can go right there and look through, look through that. So it's always good. Uh, I was just going to ask: Is there any controversy around using a tool like App Dynamics in production? No, oh, I we, we fully use like all of our systems, all of our integration environments, everything that we do is fully instrumented with everything, so that you can see that from <coughs> tiny check-in code to the time that you reach the customer. So nobody complains that it could impact performance itself. <coughs> Well, I'm going to tell you my opinion of that. There's a bunch of horseshit because uh, we, we've done, again, data driven theories. When I, I rolled out Hop Dynamics, we were looking at it and we saw 32 milliseconds uh, uh, difference. And you know, it, it does impact performance, 32 milliseconds. So you've got to put that performance thing into perspective. You know, if it's like one or two seconds, yeah, that's probably a you know, problem. But that means either, you know, Hop is not you know, correct or whatever. What are we having there? But support with true theory data, like we have a performance, how many people have performance testing environments? Okay, so we use that all the time. Like before, anytime we do any code release, anything like that, we, we go and we, we run a performance test so we have records back the last five years for those performance tests so we can say, hey, this, you know, this release, here's the performance on these 90 different business transactions we do with any application. So we know that, and so always support your, you know, with the data. 32 milliseconds, we made the call, can't even measure that yet. yourself. You can measure, but yourself as you can, you can't measure that amount of time. That's uh, you know three really quick points on there. Also, time app dynamics is pretty lightweight. You know, hey, Brad, it's thirty-two milliseconds. Would you close the door in the front there? Yeah, in the downstairs. No, just the um, just the office door. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, just like everything we do, support the data. It's like when people go, oh, it's a performance. Of course it's a performance impact because it's gonna go down, look through your uh, stack calls, and go through it there, and it's gonna pull the data to do that, but is it a reasonable amount of performance impact? For us, we, we determined that was fine because it was less than like 1% of the, the, you know, the application speeds. We're fine with it. So you need to use data traits for that. Pardon? All of the application would be as data traits. Right. It's expensive. Yeah, Hapti is very expensive as well. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, we, we do that all within our, so we have a baseline and everything like So each of our data centers, we actually have performance clusters in there that go in and they measure. So every data center, we can say this affects the data center this much, this affects our East Coast one this much, a Canadian one this much, and our Azure one this much. We know that information. Um, it's always funny, but it's, uh, our uh, two performance testing engineers, they, they find it funny that, like, after every test, because I, I, I like to have that data in hand so that from an operational standpoint. Jason, one quick question. Um, anything around security? Like in, in our case, we basically have a lot of PCI, PII data, so we share, you know, not troubleshooting guidelines and all that stuff. We are very, uh, you know, we are very careful about that and the GDPR requirements and all that stuff. So anything around security that you have in your troubleshooting? Or uh, we do. So the security we handle like in a different way. It's just like this. Uh, the security that's in the patching, but very, it's very, when we have a security incident, we've had a couple, 
uh, we actually take that, we take it actually a very smaller group of people uh, within that so the security guidelines and I basically we bring in the director of security and compliance, choose myself, one SRE, um, we usually don't bring the knock people in uh, on those incidents because uh, we, we try to keep that, you know, very way. Uh, we do bring a database engineer and we may bring a developer. That's that's all it deals with our security incidents. So, so we keep the circle very small. We don't do public communication. We do have the guidelines on that. We don't communicate security events until the director of security and compliance has assessed what that is. They have to do it and then they make the call to do the customer communication. If that makes sense. So the rest of this, uh, you know, we do, we work full stack, right? There's one of the things, and this is the, you know, it's the old DevOps, you know, it's, you know worked on my machine, it's all the problems up. No, we, we, I just, I won't put up with that crap. It's like, it is, you know, we are a team, we, you know, development operations. Uh, we go, uh, you know, do that. The only difference between the developer and me is I specialize in operational, you know, automation, he specializes in the software application. So I didn't go, it's the app code, and I don't go, it's just different, because we'll have developers, it's infrastructure, like none of it. We never do that, and we never go. Oh, it's just the software as a service problem. We never do that. We 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 work full stack all the way down, and we we actually have uh, troubleshooting guidelines where we can you know, drop down on there and, and look at that. So we, we'll go right from when it comes into our our edge of our network perimeter, and we work down through the application stack, and we work everything through there when we're troubleshooting a, a problem. That makes sense. Um, we uh, you know we do. Uh, yeah, because we use Zoom, we always somebody like I said with communication, we always have somebody's screens shared, and we're going through whether somebody's troubleshooting. We're watching. You've got many eyes on. Anybody know why the reason that is? Why we make sure that everybody shares all the time during an incident. Communication, communication and feedback. So you go, no, 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 no. That's I don't think that. Or I say, oh, I see that. It, you know that pattern, that thing. You look here and do this. So we're just making sure the communication is very high. Um, when you know my, my teams, uh, they go into the, the response teams. Um, I make sure that they leverage me so with full availability because, I, like I said, I will go and I will go and knock down somebody's door if I need a resource or whatever it is. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's CEO, CTO, C whatever. I'll, if I need them, as a, you know, some of them there, I just go and go. Yep, yeah, I need this. And I'm not afraid to do that. Um, so then there's just like two things we always look at is you know, we we always determine it's a break fix situation, right? You know, do we either have to roll back, or is there something we do to restore services as quick as possible? Um, and we, but before we make the fix, we make it, and we, we kind of have a go you know, inside the incident call. We go, are we going to make this worse? And we kind of you know give consensus, and, get, and then we go, okay, go do it, go fix it, and do it. And so we do whatever we do to restore services as fast as possible. Um, we use you know uh, the, the use chat features. I love Slack because of the pin and sharing and you know, being able to do that. That also helps with my uh, analysis afterwards, having those type of things in there. So we have important data points, important data screenshots, anything like that. Pin so I can get to get to there. Um, so we do that, and so again, like I said, we, we we communicate very liberally, very verbose, and saying things like, "Oh, well, we might have to go revert that study back." database here and there, but we have it in there so we know that we're doing so we make sure to do that. And one of the things is, is uh, you know, for our change control process, we do that, it goes out the door on a production incident. We don't go, oh, we need to go get to a change advisory board, we need to go through and, you know, make sure that this, uh, you know, our, we have a, like a lightweight process where there's a few people involved or, you know, anytime we make configuration changes, whatever, but during a production incident, we don't care. We just go do, we just get it done. We'll go back and talk about the changes afterwards, but we, we do it to get the services restored as quick as possible. Is that when you put in like official change requests so that they can change terraforms, uh, configuration changes um, because of this? Is that? Right, right. And then SCR after the fact. Right? We do it after the fact, so for tracking purposes, right? But we, uh, when we do that, so like during the event, if we need to spin up, so like, we just throw that all out and just go, no, 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 and then we'll, we'll come back and revisit that. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, who's writing up the postmortem? Is it a group effort where they send in, this is what I did, and then you piece it together? So, or, I'll, I'll get to that here. We'll get to that part of this. So, yes, uh, I'll kind of jump in. Yes, um, we, we do a group postmortem. Right, and generally what happens is uh, TDO takes the first stab at doing the timeline, and we have a you know full postmortem template. So we do a timeline, we you know analyze it, and we go through, we take a stab at it. But then I also uh, socialize it to the like the response team, and I go, hey, you guys need to look at this, and it's tell me if I'm wrong, and this is like you know it's you know with all of our servers, I don't know everything, even I've been you know part of the 
operations team the longest of the company. Um, but I'll take the first stab, but it's a group effort. And then we do a formalized post-mortem process where we take at least 30 minutes to an hour and we'll go through the whole thing. And then what we do is when we do that post-mortem, like everybody is part of the team or any of the stakeholders, we'll go in and have remediation you know, problems. Uh, you know, what we have to do, steps we have to do, the site jury tasks to do it, and we'll, we'll do all that in, in the process. That makes sense. So uh, I, I usually I'm getting really good at writing postmortems. I should write a book on how to write postmortems. <laughs> it's definitely an art. Same thing with uh, trust page updates. When I first started this, you know, it's like it is now an art for for me to have to communicate the customer, but not communicate too much information, but communicate enough that they can't call bullshit on us. So one of the things, and this is uh, we call it RBR RRR. Is how our it's a process of how we get this feedback loop uh, within uh, there, there and how we do it. So during an incident, goal is fix it fast. It's as fast as you can get it fixed. I don't. Uh, I, I, people start going, well, the root cause is this. I go, no, 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 no. We're not. We're not doing root cause right now. We're not in a position to do that. We don't have enough data to do that. We always just go fix it as fast as possible. So what we do is the idea is we restore first. We get that there. We verify customer service, and then we go back afterwards to the post form and repair that item that we're doing. That makes sense. So we, we do this, and again, I always say uh, that after the incidents, we focus on fixing it right and focus on root cause. We're going to figure out why that is because we need to fix it, so you know, we need to do that. So, and then we try to prevent reoccurrence, right? Because that's why you want to fix it right. So we go in and we record, you know, what we're doing post-mortem. This is part of that feedback loop. We make the necessary repair changes. They may have been made already. They do that, and then we can resolve that issue and it's, it's out there and on to the next incident. Any question? So, how many people service are starting to go back to normal? Now. This is actually where the real fun begins. And this is actually when I talk about this, uh, the, the feedback loop, because a lot of times I've worked with a lot of companies like, oh, this is over, and then I okay, go back to normal. No, this is actually where the real work begins, is because what you want to do is you want to focus on now providing a feedback loop. And uh, that feedback loop is very, very important, right? And for us, in my company, since we have a, such a complex piece of software, there can be any number of factors that do that, but we make sure that feedback loop. For instance, we had a report that somebody ran that actually took out our reporting servers because it was bringing back, this is no lie, it was inserting 54,000 variables into a SQL query and scanning a 96, uh, 96 million uh, row table and doing inner joins on that table. <laughs> Dropped everything in there. So what we had to do, even though it was the customers, we had to do it with our feedback loop and we did this in the process, we were able to go back to customers and go, yeah, I can't do that, but here's, here's the solution to it. We came with our solution to it. The report would take out the server, we got the report run in like four seconds. Afterwards, and then give it a better way. So, when most services are stored, you're not done. You may be able to, you know, stand down, but you still have work to do. So, one of the things: how many people have? Uh, this was uh, this is kind of a joke, but how many people have had, uh, you know, their uh, record postmortems in Jira or Confluence? This is one of the things I thought was really funny: is 108 op open postmortems they have to do before the, we we don't ever get there because we believe the, the feedback loop. And so, you know, what you want to do is start your instant analysis as soon as you can. Um, I like to do, actually look at it, and we have within our instance, uh, it's in form when I'm sending about our, our Excel chatbot, it'll actually make a, in our service test, it records the incident, so we actually have that juror there, already there. We go back there, we start, to, we try to go, here's what it is, here's what I have, and, you know, and we look at a few different things, so I'll go over there, but, don't take longer than one or two days, a, you know, for a postmortem. That, that's really important. What? Anybody know why? Forget. Forget, Forget it. it. Forget it. Right. You start going. Oh well. Did that happen? I'm not sure. And then it just gets harder and harder to write a cohesive uh, postmortem. So we really, we really try to do within one to two days to do it and get it done. Sometimes, you know, life gets in the way. We've had weeks where we had like incident after incident after incident. Do that. The other thing that we do, and this is one of the things that we have a formalized process for every Friday, because uh, we're, I, I, we're government, government, well not government work, but we have government workers using our software. So it gets really high peak usage, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it sells off on Friday. I tell you, by like two o'clock in the afternoon, we're like, we can here. And so Friday afternoons, we always do a, in this week's incident analysis where we go through, we try to look at a few things, and I'll, I'll show you our Jira form here in a second. 
So we try to do this. Don't have 108 open, you know, post boredoms because you're not going to get to those. And this is like cheesy, but track all the things. This is one of the things that uh, we, we really try to do. I, uh, you know, I was a database engineer for about 10 years of my career, mainly focused on, you know, millions and millions of databases. I love tracking things in databases because there's amazing stuff that you can find from that. So kind of the, this is the KPIs that I track within my team. I, we, 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 uh, we try to track these. I actually communicate these to the executive level every week. Uh, I give a report on Monday. So we give average re resolution time for uh, an incident. So we do the uh, average initial response time on there, how fast will people get in and do that. And does anybody know that's important? The average, uh, average initial response time. So we try to go in and figure out when this incident started. And when we respond, it's, that's that's super important. Oh, yeah. Say, you know, the longer that is, that, that you've got a bad thing. If you guys, you can go, oh, boom, there's a problem, and you start it instead a minute later. That's a good thing for the customer. So check that. We also track SLA compliance rates with us. Uh, we have, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, but we have we're, we're three nights, but we only have a two and a half nights uh, to uh, um, SLA. That's actually contractual for my customer. So we have 99.5 percent instead of 99.9. We're, we're well over 99.9 most most days, but it's, uh, we do that. But we actually we look at the compliance rate and see you know, what that is on there. And then the second thing is this first call resolution rate. You know, first time somebody threw it in there, it has the incident opened uh, over and over again, tracking all the things. We make sure that you know this one this is a new incident, a new problem that you know, we didn't run into. Uh, we do track a lot that goes along with it. Is this a repeat incident? Is this, uh, is this happening again? Is this report, is this, uh, you know, uh, JavaScript that they ran within the application? Has they been causing it over and over again? But that's really important because it says we're not addressing the issues. Um, any reopen rates? How many people did an incident and then, you know, two hours later, you know, it comes back up? Happened to me today. We resolved an incident and then about an hour later, the same customer, same thing, came back up and they were like, well, that's a reopen. We didn't resolve it and it's because we didn't have time to actually go to the customer, right? Correct. Um, forgive me if this is uh, this question that is otherwise answered in another way. But how do the how do the customers how are they escalating issues up to you? So coming through a chat. So or, we actually they, they actually there, there's two ways. We actually use uh, we have uh, the the country Salesforce. We have Salesforce community, which we have people actively monitoring if there's anything. So like if there's a question or anything like that, because we we kind of have a thing if they're just kind of looking and asking questions. We're, is that a problem? And there, and then the second way is they have an official route where they can actually call or email our support. We have a tier one, tier two, and tier three support team on there. So the tier one, they'll look at it and do that, and then they'll go immediately, they'll escalate to tier two or tier three or uh, do that. Guess who in my company can start a production incident? Everybody. Doesn't matter who you are. If you think it's a production incident, I make sure to raise so it's like, you know, uh, the tier one support guy goes, I think this is a production incident. Boom, it's there. The, the reason being is I want to be able to respond, respond to that as quick as possible. I don't want to go wait five minutes and then send it to tier two. Tier two looks like saying that's not my problem. I send it to tier three, tier three. They're like, yeah, this looks like a problem. Maybe we should start production. And that's 30 minutes later. Yeah. We, 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 we allow people, anybody to start. So we've had sales guys start pods. Out there. Does that make sense though? You know, I'm here with this customer or having an incident to start a production. If that makes sense. I know that sounds crazy, but that's it's how the, you know, improve it, you know, improve customer service. Um, if, and so anybody, if a tier one guy, he gets a phone call from a customer that goes, you know, or have a problem, they excel about prods, uh, whatever, and then they do, they do it. So we, we just make sure from a you know, reaction, reactionary standpoint that we try to, to do that as quick as possible and with the least amount of escalation as possible. Jason, I'm sorry, I don't want enough about your business, but do you share any of this information with your customers? We do not. The only thing we share is on time. That's the only metric we share with customers. I'm doing that because it's, it's sticky contractually. We have like very long, very, very expensive contracts that we do. And you know, any IT guy that can get out of, uh, you know, with us, we have SLA agreements. And so we only share like the uptime. We don't uh, you know, do individual services. We don't do any of these things as well. What if you have a customer asks for this? Um, I have not in two years had a customer ask for it. They, 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 the only thing they ever asked was about time reports from us. And we have runners on site 24 seven to provide that for uh, all of our customers. 
on there. Um, one of the things I do, I, I like to communicate to customers, but I don't like to give them app on that. And it's also because we're a multi-tenant, you know, 2,400 different customers. Um, this would be, you know, a couple of people's full-time jobs. Yeah. yeah, if you have that many customers, yeah. That's what, what I don't really have to of it. Yeah, what, what we're planning to do is with the trust page is we're going to start actually having it report uptime metrics for each of our different clusters to there so that they we don't even have to generate a report, so it'll just be there we're like you go there and, and get that. Um, some of the other things we have like incident backlog, stuff that came out of the incident, the incidents, we, we track that, like how many things we gotta fix, how many people have a huge backlog. Mine's probably 3,000 items, and we have to prioritize every day on it to, to do that, but we, we report this to the executives. Uh, percentage of major incidents, we actually give a uh, rubric of you know, the incidents and the, you know, the size of them. I'll kind of show you those in this research, it's kind of what we do. Um, one of the new things I'm starting to do, just so that people understand, is we're taking, a, and I just got this from HRI, I went to the HRI, but don't tell me anybody's salaries, but take everybody in engineering, everybody in operations, take their salaries, average it, and now I report cost per incident. And then what we're, we're going to take that to another level for the executives is what is the potential business cost of the incident? Anybody know that's important? Well, you want to know your cost for poor quality, right? Right. So poor quality cost, poor quality cost money. It's it's expensive. When you've got you've got uh, you know ten engineers on an incident ten hours a day, you know, and they're paid you know thousand dollars a day you know, for work. It starts getting very expensive to have poor quality on there. And then at the end of the thing with the, with the incidents, and this is funny, but I actually, when we close out with the customers, we get a satisfaction rate. I asked them to fill out a survey doing that. Um, and you know why I want that? If I communicated properly, and we've worked with them, and we've been able to uh, touch them and say, hey, you do this, you know, here's what we did, this is do. You know what, I have a 4.9 rating with the customers. And the reason is communication. Because it's like, you know, everybody else, stuff pulls up. It's made by humans. It says that I'm not perfect. I mean, I would like to be, but uh, you know, this service may have had a problem or knocked over a noisy neighbor problem, or, you know, one of these things. But I want to know you, know, you feel good that the incidents were close to your satisfaction. And so, like, five star service, love you guys, like that. So, we really try to make sure those. And then, you know, we talk about the hits of feedback, right? The other kind of thing we do, postmortems. You know, this is my this is my kind of guide for postmortems here. You know, we schedule uh, sub one, sub zero within three calendar days. Those are major incidents. Uh, sub two and three, so we try to do within five business days to get a scheduled postmortem. Um, you know, we all suffer from the same thing of being itis, and so I try to, you know, with the sub twos and threes, I try to you know, push that out so we can get there. Um, one of the, my guidelines is I really, really, really try to keep postmortems no more than 30 minutes. Here's the thing is by the, we should have all the incident analysis done. You should have the root cause uh, and all of that long before the postmortem. The, the postmortem deserves to go over the timeline. Is to talk with the team on there and is to provide remediation steps on there. Um, uh, one of the things, and you're asking, you know, kind of TDO, why, you know, who does the, the postmortems? And usually it's a TDO, uh, it's myself or my uh, other manager on my team. Um, we'll go in and we pull in whoever we need. I don't care if you're busy, I don't care if you're this, you come in, you gotta fix this, so you gotta fix it. So I'll, I'll go to engineering and I'm like, you, you, and you, you gotta kind of work with this. Like, but I got stuff to do. I'm like, yeah, you're gonna help me do this and figure it out. Um, I, Jira, I, I use Jira. Does everybody here use Jira or some sort of ticketing system? Um, Jira, I have a love-hate relationship with it, but I, I, I use it religiously to be able to track things. And I, when these guys just all day long and they're going, hey, where, where are we out with this? So I use Jira to make sure you do that. So whatever you use for ticket tracking, make sure you use it to its fullest extent. Um, when we go to the postmortem, one of my guidelines is I have to make sure I get a three-way handshake from everyone that they've actually read the postmortem and they don't have anything else to add in addition. So when we go to the postmortem and we have a postmortem meeting, we go through these things that you know, we have mediation steps, everything, it's kind of more of like we all get an agreement, we have a few things to add, but it, it makes it go very quickly. I hate long postmortems where you know, people talk, talk, talk for hours and hours and hours and you know, talk about root causes. That, that, that's nobody any good. You need to have a, a, a mediation plan what you're going to do out there. We communicate uh, the postmortem through actually, uh, I put this through Jared. We actually go through confluence. Um, we make sure that all of our postmortems were published. Uh, anybody know why we do this? Where do you publish? We publish in our CloudOps Confluence Wiki. 
I mean, who's the audience? It's, it's uh, my company. So every new employee that comes on their first week on the job uh, within the operations team, they get to read through all of those. Uh, one, they see about the incidents, they understand that, they also, too, get an idea of what they're you know, running into and how you know, it's fixed, whether it's, uh, we make sure that it gives them an education of the software. I can't tell you how, how many employees are going, this is fantastic, they just go in and go, we've never had a company that has every instance. So I usually do not remember what I was doing at work last week. That's why I keep reporting those. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, our, our, uh, our incidents, I mean, it's like, people, it also educates people on there, and that's, that's good, but it also has a history, so you know what's going on. Um, one of the last things, and I, I showed you that our, you know, RCA template to do, uh, one of the last things I do is I make sure that we have a, uh, for step zero and ones for sure, sometimes for twos, but never for step three events, we make sure there's an RCA so customers understand that we're trying to fix the problem. And then, like I said, no more than, I, I try to keep post orders for 30 minutes, but no more than 60 minutes. That's, that's the point where I'm just like, it's too long and to do that. I've been in companies where we've had post orders for hours and hours and hours, and it just it doesn't go anywhere. I, I used to manage our uh, QA team, and one of the things that I had them do was to review the incidents and the postmortem and all, and find out whether do you have those scenarios built into your test suite or not. Right. And, so. and we bring QA in in our postmortem, so they're, they're part of it. And then one of the things that we do, um, we capture all kinds of data on incidents. Um, I'm a big fan of that because I like delivering information for executives because it makes them, it, well, it makes me look really good because it's told by our ECTL that uh, I have the best running engineering team in the company, which I do. Um, <laughs> but we capture data and we do that. We do the, we capture the data and we try to capture the right data so that we can do that. And this is, the data you capture, it's going to depend on your, your service, your application, things like that. But we do, you know, we have a summary, we have a, a status here. If you can look at this, we have stuff that's a work in progress. I mean, that's an actually active incident we haven't set resolution. I actually, with all of our incidents that we set them when we track them, we have a, a mode where over our incident review, I have to validate your, your, your response, your, you know, what you've done to validate it, your, your summary, uh, root cause, or we have a suspected cause that we capture on there. But I validate every single incident that comes through because I want to go, like, you know, kind of anal reach into that way and make sure that, yeah, we did that. Or I go, no, go back, we got to go fix that. So to do that, we capture things like, you know, the date and time, who it was, who's in the incidents. Uh, I use Jira's labels very liberally. We have these, all of these are all auto-generated when the, the incident ticket, the, you know, the severity. We actually have, you know, what service it is, uh, things like that. Same thing, you know, this is important when we capture what service and what the incident was about. We track that. Metrics go back and you feedback to development. For my company, what we do is that actually uh, every quarter they use my data to determine where we're investing in the product for that quarter. That makes sense. So we, we capture what it is, which product it is, which cluster it is. So we go, I go on my team down, I think we're probably East Coast or here. Um, we also do scope of impact, and then a couple of things we have in there that's not shown in there. We have the, either we and we get a root cause from the people, you know, like a, a, a two liner, what the root cause is. This is just you know, in the data so that the executives can read through it. What we do, the one thing is, is how many people have had like an incident and they just couldn't find why your service knocked over or why it didn't happen to us many times. And so I just would like, be honest and say, here's a suspected cause, what I think it is, is threat starvation, you know, due to this. And, and here, you know, wildfire opening, instantiating way too many database connections, not closing the problem. You know, we put the, that's the suspected cause and then I put in there. So no, I don't know, but here's what I think. Jason, do you use any of this data to do any analytics against it and to help you basically better prepare when incidents happen? We do, we do, and we, we, we use it for, uh, you know, things like, again, like uh, we have a workflow engine, so we know that I use the data to go, oh, we're going to, you know, we, we know that uh, a goal is going to go on, we're going to probably have this many reporting incidents, we have a new agency coming on board, and so we use that to be able to prepare for things like that. What do you use for? The data analytics. I just use Excel. I mean, it's not like I don't use any business oh, intelligence. I mean, this is just like a flat file database. So, you know, it goes with this. You don't have data. What? You can use any tool, you know, to do it. It's like, so we use Jira to capture it, and then I uh, just go in and create reports out of that, and then I export that data out, and I bring it into Excel. Not fancy, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's over here. We use it, and I'll show you a couple of the tools we use. So, anybody know what a Pareto is? Okay. 
basically what it is is a stack chart so it takes like the it's kind of the 80 20 rule we go ahead and we stack incidents and they're kind of classified on what the problem was how it is how urgent it was this was last quarters right you know this was embarrassing for me there's configuration management problem for my team um, i was able to tell uh, at least i was able to go to the executives and they're like well why did you do that and i go because we moved two new data centers that we had no idea our, our software had never been documented before i came there our deployments were all manual. All of this stuff was automated, and you know, it was a legacy system where they used to do anything and everything for a customer, and so we didn't know. So we had last quarter 18 configuration management problems on there. That was things like we didn't have the right settings for our customer, or, you know, something like that. But at least I can, you know, go to the, and, and talk to the executives about this. We can look at this, you know, we go down through and do this. So what they're doing is every quarter they come in and go, oh, so configuration guardrails. We're going to go ahead and invest in there so we can actually put some bumpers into place for you know a few of the things. Are they looking at uh, production code defect? Okay, that's one of the higher ones. So we're going to put some money into tackling technical debt and like our API latency. Um, you know, they're like, oh, well, one of the things we found is a uh, long story is we have, we have an API that's asynchronous, but the problem is it's our business servers that do all the business logic and processes are not. So it's not really asynchronous because the last thing on the chain, it actually is still, uh, you know, serialized. And we were talking with the executives and I'm getting them to go, okay, we're going to invest in being able to do asynchronous calls through a pulse sub type of system, something like that. But it's, for me, it's being able to give them that data back to go, this is where we invest. And, you know, what we do is, you know, one of the things I would talk about, you asked about, you know, the loop, you know, we use for this. And this is like the kind of really drill down to what it is, is go do something, do deployment, do whatever, measure it, analyze it, correct it, do it again. And uh, that's kind of the loop with the, the idea between a feedback loop is you got to have the, you know, small feedback loops to do this. I know a lot of people told me, oh, we don't do instant analysis because we're running DevOps. Well, yeah, you still need to, you know, DevOps is a mindset and we still need to do that incident management process. And so it's, it's always about doing it, measuring it, analyzing it, correct your actions because, you know, uh, one of the things that I always told my, my team is that, and this is like the best thing ever, is we, we still have some cultural things to change, but on my team, if you screwed up, my team goes, yeah, I did it. I'm sorry, let's go correct it and get it done and do that. And I like that part of a culture of a, of a team is going, you know, because I know you're human, I'm human, we screw up, but we also know that if we can recognize we screw up, do the corrective action, then we can go out and do something else, and then if we screw up, we do it, and it gets a, a better quality product. Anybody have any questions before I kind of just show you some of the, you know, the way we track things? Day, we just go into Jira. I, I have actually, yes, I use okay. I use Easy BI to track some of the data in here from uh, it's like an add on to uh, take a few minutes here. So we have things like this and uh, dashboard. You know, I have I use a, a very liberal use of dashboarding and things like doing the issue analysis. Let's look up here in just a second. You can see here I'm a very much data driven uh, person. You can see here the, the, the disparities per week. We make sure we track that. We give that to give that to there. We also look at it as here, like here's the instance per quarter, and this is the service that uh, was causing us. And so we do that so that we can be able to do that. So we use, you know, it's not heavy analysis. But it's enough that uh, I'm able to, to provide, you know, enough information so that we can make informed decisions. We don't use, you know, AI. We don't use any of that stuff. It's just straight. Here's where it is. This is what happened. As long as it works good for you, yeah. right? You know, is one of those expensive tools. Right, right, right. right. So does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? I can kind of show you. Here's our Jira service desk. Jump over there. Our service desk is actually what tracks the incidents. That's different from our planned work. We kind of take it in my team, we take a two pronged approach. We have unplanned incidents, and that's through the service desk. And then we have planned work that we do, like what we're going to fix, what we're doing during it with the regular sprint. Let's see. So Jira does, it tracks incidents and it's a development tool. Both. 
Yeah, I, I do. I, I track both. Uh, I, I use actually a thing called it's called Cheer Service Desk. I actually use that to track the, the, the incidents or request. I use it for a couple of things. So we use it for tracking incidents. We use it for tracking, you know, or doing like service requests as well. I track that because we, we assign SLAs to different service request items um, as well. And then I also like it be the integration. I go, oh, well, this, you know, some ambiguous request comes in from the team. I go, oh, I should refer this to plan work and put a spring that is moving over to the board and do that. Be a service now for right. Yeah. Any of the tools work. It just uh, you know whatever you use. I like the integration between them, so I'm not like jumping back and forth. Yeah, we use that too. But that that is a little bit of a disconnect because you have service. The state uses service now. But in development, we use Jira. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I so development too. We use PFS on Azure DevOps. Right. So here's an example of uh, I'm working on a. Uh, Right, because we're reporting, we track quite a bit of data. I was just going to kind of share an example here in here. I like Jira Breath um, just for the fact that uh, I can, I'm able to customize the hell out of it. I'm able to customize workflows, you know, things like that. I just I've been using them for you know last ten years of my career. So we actually on every single incident, we actually track a lot. This is actually one we track a lot of information. You can see we have you know data center floors, what products it is. If there's a Salesforce associated. With it, how long the impact was, and that's from the very first, you know, the customer to the when when it was fixed. Scope of it, we do root cause, like I said, root cause, expected cause. Uh, we actually have a for those burrito charts. We actually have a, a different categories here that we we know are those, and then I can always update those. And then the final thing we you know I track and I track with my doc is did you have to ask like bring an SRE on because that's like common. And they're you know they're expensive and they should be knowing what they're doing. Um, and did you have to bring on one of the senior SREs? But they're very expensive. We have to do things like that. You guys have any questions, comments? Uh, I had uh, so so we have a similar we have a really complicated app, uh, and so on the, on the operations side, it is sometimes really hard to troubleshoot. So how do you coordinate uh, or provide feedback to help? The proper tooling that can give them feedback. So, a lot of times, what we do. So, one of our like our we have a process. To, so, for one of the things I really try to do, because all of our stuff is you know, low balance behind the, the little balancer. A lot of times, what we do is I'll make the, while we're still having the issue. I'll make them start taking a memory dump and pull it out of the load, load balancer, and so we'll actually you know provide an HPOS files to do the, the detailed analysis. I also make sure that with the application that they're using any APM of any form. Are. Okay, uh, the, the AI, I swear by APMs. Uh, if we're going to go to application performance metrics, uh, being able to go inside the application, do a new relic, app dynamics, uh, you know, so the whole slew of them, uh, Elasticsearch. So I swear by those. Reason being is, I, especially with the APM, like we're, we're going to be switching to Elastic Stack. Uh, it's kind of a press couple of meetups ago when they came in. So we're thinking I do that for a cost reason. It's going to reduce the amount of cost and get the same value. but. I'm able to go and give our developers stack traits, logs, uh, you know, put in all of those right in front of them to do a real analysis. We typically, my team, my team's developers as well, but they just you know, do operational development. Um, we're able to kind of go into the application. I go, okay, that's the stack trace. That's that. I'm able to give deep analysis. We really use develop the software developers only when we can't figure out the problems. Yeah. But so we do, you know, we do memory dumps, and then we have stack traces, and we give them. Logs as much logs. Uh, I love logs because you know if you actually, I, I, I'll, I'll take that. Back. I like logs that I love logs that are actually meaningful. And so you know, over the last year, I've been working with the uh, development team to actually give me meaningful. You know, not don't give me a Java. You know, and spill out eighty line. You know, eighty logs, eighty lines in the log file. Tell me the Java stack. You know, work that here. Tell me my problem. Much more meaningful, but so we, we use all those tools to get that deep analysis. And so usually within the stack trace, you know. Very, very terrible Java developer, but I know enough that I can usually go figure out right where the code is at and, and help identify that in the post mortem yeah. when we do that. Jason, do you have any of your SREs kind of sit on any of the dev scrum teams? We do. We actually we have uh, an SRE embedded in every single one of the teams. Um, we, we, we have them in for two things. It's, uh, again, communication, right? Yeah. They're, they're not part of the team, so the scrum teams can't assign them any, you know, anything since we have our own, you know. Of work that we do, but what we do is uh, when they're having meetings, I, I require them to be at least in the sprint review and the sprint planning meeting with them. Uh, the reason being is sometimes there's you know if a, a team's developing a new product or service, 
I don't know, maybe like three days before launch. And, you know, I have a, like a new major version we're, we're rolling out tomorrow night. I don't want them to come to me today and go, oh, I forgot that we need this infrastructure in place. It's like, no. So we, we do things called a production readiness review, and that's why we embed them. And then it's also to give them feedback on, say, that it's, uh, you know, we, we talk about it as uh, the happen that affected your product or service that they're, they're in on, their, on, on that. They don't really attend daily you know, scrum meetings, things like that, because it's just too much time, but I don't believe it's too much time for meetings. But we do in the sprint reviews and, you know, like the retrospects and in the planning, I make them be part of it. Anything else? What was the root cause for your last search you paid? Pardon? What was the root cause for your elastic search you paid? Uh, let me back, what was it? Oh, yeah, the, uh, the uh, corrupt entity. I spent a lot of time with it recently, so. So uh, there was actually, we found a software defect in the, what happens is uh, our, our product, they do data loads. And so the, well, the software doesn't handle the data loads very you know, correctly. So we had corrupt indices that had to go out and kill them and rebuild them and then fix those. Classic search is its own beast. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's very flexible, but so if you can choose something to play, it's not coordinating or Dev team as, I, as I've told everybody, it works really well until it doesn't. <laughs> so is your incident process company-wide, or is it by just your team uses it? Or? Uh, it's just really mainly the, the operations team. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's who's involved in the incident. But I, I bring people in it. Company-wide, they're familiar. Anybody does any of the development work or is customer-facing, they're familiar with the incident process. So it's, it's, yeah. That process, like I said, in there, we have a call off general channel, that just, and everybody, when you, you get a Slack account, it's automatically subscribed to that channel. And so anybody in that channel can raise this. It's, and it's uh, in, in the channel, it actually has a link to it, the training on it, do it. So, like I said, I've had AEs, you know, account executives raise them, I've had, you know, uh, field folks raise them, you know, things like that to, to bring it to our attention. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you. Hey Jason. Yeah, I can just throw this out to everybody real quick. On the 28th and 29th of this month, we are doing 